welcome to another episode of Hemp Barons. On today's show, Joy and her guest have an in-depth conversation about the process of working with the FDA and what steps the industry will need to complete to get CBD and other cannabinoids approved for human consumption. They discuss one of the most important next steps is collecting and consolidating user data and how CBD companies are working together to assist in the process. Let's join Joy's conversation with Patrick McCarthy from Valid Care and the CBD Plus Me app. Well, hello, Patrick. Thank you for being with us on Hemp Parents today. Hey, thanks for having me, Joy. Really, really appreciate it. Valid Care, and particularly the app that Valid Care has created, CBD Plus Me, is really taking on some of the most important work as we undergo this public health revolution and the discovery of the endocannabinoid system and this incredible non-intoxicating compound within the hemp plant, within the genus cannabis, called cannabidiol, or CBD. And as we know, the FDA has been saying for some years now that it is illegal to market CBD as a dietary supplement or a food. And they say that for two reasons. One, of course, the statutory function within the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, known as the IND, or Investigational New Drug Preclusion, basically in layman's terms, to simplify it as much as possible, if a substance hasn't been marketed as a dietary supplement or a food prior uh, to research being made public to create a, a drug with it or to apply as an investigational new drug, it cannot be marketed as a dietary supplement or a food. And having said that, the FDA has authority within that same statute to break that rule, change its mind, and say, you know what, we believe this is a safe substance. So despite the fact that it has been applied for to be a drug, which we all know epidiolex has been approved as a drug, and that is a pure form, an isolated form of the CBD molecule, they say, hey, it can also be marketed as a dietary supplement or a food. And what they are, we're, we're waiting for, and what they are demanding, the FDA, is safety data that will make them comfortable uh, with the uh, low risk and, and public health uh, of, of CBD. And what they're waiting for and what they've been asking for is safety data so that they can make a determination as to uh, the safety level of CBD and be assured that there are no risks to public harm. Having said that, of course, the World Health Organization performed a critical review on CBD. They published that in June of 2018 and came to the conclusion that this is a, a safe compound, generally well tolerated, with no real potential for abuse or dependency, and that there's no evidence of any recreational use of CBD. But here we are needing to uh, compile this safety data. And you, Patrick McCarthy, um, between the important work that Valid Care is doing with human liver toxicity studies and the app, are really building that bridge and doing some of the most important work to build the hemp extract and hemp CBD industry. Valid Care, of course, uh, engages and detains clients, uh, conducts market intelligence and clinical research, and really are some of the most important advocates we have right now. Please, Patrick, tell us a little bit about what Valid Care is doing and then explain to us the CBD Plus Me app, which is available in the app store. Sure. Well, wow. Thank you, Joy. Yeah, we're really excited about the work that we're doing. Uh, <clears throat> sometimes you find yourself in a place where there's a, a big need and uh, without meaning to get there. And I, I think we found that. We came into the marketplace about four years ago after monitoring folks that were signing up for orthopedic surgery, of all things. And Mary's Nutritionals um, CEO was across the street from me and said, I need that app for my consumers. And I said, what are you talking about? She said, we need to track them and help understand what they're using, why they're using and what it does for them. Because we're not allowed to market, but we sure can listen. And so with that, we took our healthcare based app platform and brought it over to the hemp derived product area. And we've allowed brands to brand our CBD plus me app, which is in both Android and the app store to their brands if they like. So any consumer can go to the app store now, download the app and they can start tracking 
and seeing what certain products do for them. And they can they can actually report into why they're using products. And this is all done legally because it's consumers just giving insights back to the marketplace. For brands like Elixinol and American Shaman and other customers, they can actually customize the app for their consumers and engage them in real time and push to them information on education or around product. But they can then glean those insights from the consumers as well and engage them. And right now in the market with, um, you know, with the downturn, it's been really challenging for a lot of commercial brands and they're, they're trying to figure out how to hold on to their customers. And so with this, you really are in the pocket of your consumer and you can engage with them in two-way communication safely without the, the restraints that are put on by Google and Facebook and otherwise. We, we just make certain that everything is safe from an FTC perspective so no one's making claims that FTC or FDA would have an issue with. Um, but all that said, the same app platform is used for clinical research. Coming out of traditional healthcare, we understand that there is a need for people to understand the effects of <clears throat> cannabinoids on the endocannabinoid system. And so certain brands have sponsored research with us to look at opioid addiction and how CBD uh, can actually impact folks that are on Suboxone, for example. And so we've uh, conducted some studies on, on behalf of clients that way. But as we saw what's going on with the regulatory path, back in May, uh, we submitted some of the data that we had and we asked the FDA, hey, how can we help? And if we can get you more information, would that be useful? So we finally got a, a meeting with them in person in December, presented our data that we've collected to date and said, we, we hear you have concerns around liver toxicity. And if so, how about we put together a collaboration of industry brands to collect data from people that are already using CBD products and then measure liver enzymes after 30 days of use and see what we see. So with that, FDA was really, really excited uh, by the news and they've opened up a channel of communication for us to submit to them observational data plus blood results to help them really understand if there's a true concern out there. Like you said, they're just not sure if there is a public health issue. The, the data from Epidiolex in really sick kids on immunotherapy and anticonvulsants points to there could be some liver issues. And so FDA is not a, a creative agency, nor do I think we want them to be, but they make decisions off of data and off of science. And they're saying, gosh, we need the science. So um, we've now inserted ourselves to circle back to the beginning into the, into the middle of industry and said, hey, I think we can help. So we're trying to bring as many brands together to introduce us to their consumers and collect information from consumers uh, through a, an observational study. And the University of Kentucky is going to work with us as the host facility. And so we're really, really excited about getting this, this data and then bringing it forward. So no guarantees it's going to be good news or bad news, but at least we'll finally have the type of data that FDA is looking for. And it's so fascinating uh, what's going on. And thank you for spearheading this. And so we can dial it back a little bit for the listeners when we talk about claims and when we talk about liver toxicity and sort of put that in perspective. So in the United States, we have laws. When you say FTC, we're talking about the Federal Trade Commission, FDA, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, and we have laws around how we can advertise certain products. And when, and when it's an ingestible product for humans, it can only be one of three things, right? It's either going to be a drug, a supplement, or a food, food and beverage. They get their own category. Those are the three things that you can be qualified as in the United States of America if you're going to consume it orally, if a human is going to consume it orally. And if you're a drug and you've been approved as a drug, which means you've been approved to be able to make certain claims because you've gone through clinical trials, you've gone through quite a rigid, stringent application process with the FDA, and they have approved you to make certain claims about your approved drug. Well, uh, drugs involve, of course, disease states. Disease states include insomnia, anxiety, depression, pain, inflammation, those are actual disease states and they cannot be, uh, con we're not allowed to confuse the American consumer by discussing those disease states in the same conversation or label or package or marketing material or website as dietary supplements or food. 
And there are laws around that. And so, um, number one, cannabidiol, of course, and what the endocannabinoid system does to really dial it back is it controls homeostasis. And homeostasis is the great regulator that, that is the master regulator for all of the body systems. When we think about, of course, how complicated the inner workings of the human body are and how many different conditions that we have to react to throughout the day, changes in temperature, changes in anxiety level, uh, we're hungry or full or bloated or we get a headache, yet everything within our body still needs to operate optimally with breathing, circulation, all of those things. And so that's homeostasis. And for us to have discovered the endocannabinoid system in our lifetimes is sort of paramount to or, or analogous to discovering that the earth is round and not flat. We have more of these, these cannabinoid receptors um, in our brains than we do neurotransmitters, and it's huge. So there's such a public health revolution going on and such a burst of research, and so it's very important that while all that's going on, uh, these manufacturers of these products, of course, follow the law around claims. Attention hemp farmers, introducing Advanced Hemp, the world's first hemp-specific fertilizing system designed to maximize yield and CBD production. Advanced Hemp's team of 25 PhD plant scientists have been researching the plant for over 20 years and understand it better than anyone. Don't fail to meet your hemp's unique needs like far too many farmers did last year. For heavy yield of the high CBD hemp, feed your crop Advanced Hemp. And you can order online at advancedhemp.com. That's advancedhemp.com. But don't wait, because production is limited. So pre-order now. We also have this issue of safety and the FDA. And we appreciate the FDA. We want our products in our, you know, highly developed country here to be safe, to be quality assured. Uh, we also get concerned about special interests, which is a legitimate concern in this country. I'm not a conspiracy theorist, um, but we certainly have to address the reality of corporate interests, special interests, and the power of the almighty dollar. And I am suspicious with uh, the FDA's ongoing concern after they have been, in fact, provided with so much safety data from the industry itself. And so one example, and in full disclosure, of course, in addition to my many, many nonprofit roles and pro bono roles, I've been in hemp for 30 years. Um, I'm also the regulatory officer and industry liaison to Elixinol, which is very happy to be using that CBD plus me app um, for our customers. But we, among many other industry leaders during the public comment period where the FDA was collecting safety data for cannabis and cannabis-derived substances, provided them with safety data for our hemp extract products. We don't make products like Epidiolex, which are pure, isolated forms of CBD. And in those clinical trials, it's true that high doses of that pure form of CBD apparently did show liver increased liver toxicity in folks who already had uh, a liver toxicity or had liver problems, or they had a uh, contraindication with existing medicine, again, with those high doses of, of the pure form of of CBD versus these hemp extracts with naturally occurring or concentrated amounts of naturally occurring cannabinoids and CBD uh, within the extract. And for example, during that public comment period, Elixinol and others provided safety data. Similar to we had one product, um, just a basic tincture. We gave a, a, and we sell many, many products, but just one that one little slice was we took an 18-month period where we sold 390,000 units of that product, um, and only 12 complaints, never an adverse event. There have been no adverse events reported, as far as we know, um, certainly not to Elixinol. I mean, in the entire industry, we would, we would know it. We track every complaint, including the most prevalent complaint, which is no effect. So of those 390,000 units sold, we had 12 um, complaints. Eight were no effect, which is common. That can be for varying reasons. Two were for a stomach ache, one was for a headache, and one was for uh, a blister on the top of that customer's foot. Now, surely our tincture was not responsible for the, the blister on the top of that customer's foot, but 
There's lots and lots of safety data on top of the World Health Nation coming to the safe conclusion. And yet here we have the FDA basically fear-mongering at this point in its press release on November 25th, uh, talking about male infertility. And of course, I feel like they, they intentionally get the the subliminal message of, of male veracity and male infertility in there to really get people uh, subliminally in the root chakra to fear-monger them. Talk about uh, uh, breastfeeding and lactation when in fact, while we're breastfeeding, our bodies produce. That's the only time since post-prohibition here, uh, prior to pro the end of prohibition for hemp, that we were able to get cannabinoids in our bodies because the human breast milk creates those cannabinoids to deliver them to the breastfeeding child because they're so important for our developing bodies. And so then yeah, they talked about that liver toxicity. And I, I'm going to come to a question here in a moment, brother, I swear, but to nail my, my point home, we've got acetaminophen, which most people know is Tylenol, right? That's the generic form of Tylenol. It's available on every store. Your five-year-old can go and buy Tylenol. And uh, the reality is that during those clinical trials for safety to be, to be able to be sold over the counter, three people died. I guess there's an average, according to the Poison Control Center, of 100,000 calls a year to the Poison Control Center with concerns about liver toxicity from acetaminophen, again, Tylenol, an average of 56,000 emergency room visits, which equate to 2,600 hospitalizations a year due to low-dose acetamin liver toxicity. And then those, there's an average of somewhere around 458 deaths per year. And this is Tylenol. And we've got the FDA giving us all of this trouble uh, for CBD. Neither here nor there, no. It's the trouble they're giving us. They want the human liver toxicity studies. So please tell us how, how Valid Care came in here and is trying very hard to organize the industry and has really taken the reins on giving the FDA what they are clearly demanding in order to be able to create this regulatory framework. Sure, happy to. And that's a, a great overview there, Joy. And I think, um, you know, as, as a background, the, the farm bill as it went through descheduled cannabidiol from hemp, but it didn't call the ball and say it's either a food or an additive or, or supplement or a drug. They just left it out there, which is what has caused FDA to say, well, what is it? We got to figure out. And they may go down. As you said, it could be a food, it could be a supplement, it could be a drug. Um, they they could decide all three things ultimately, but now they want data because the only way they've seen cannabidiol before is on the drug route. So with that said, as we presented our data, as you said, um, in May, you guys presented data in, we did two, and then this past fall, we collected similar data to what you saw, and we noted that we had less than 5% of 4,000 people that reported using CBD having any kind of side effect. There were no adverse events. And um, the side effects were really mild GI distress or confusion. And then what was really interesting, the people that were taking the product reported more than 75% of the time that they had a positive effect from the product for the reason they were taking it, but another 20% said they had a secondary benefit. So it does seem like there's a lot of really, really good news around hemp-derived CBD. All that said, FDA did, does have the concern, and so here's the interesting part, and it gets a little convoluted. They don't want individual companies coming forward with, with NDIs or INDs right now, they're really worried about a public safety concern. So as we spoke to them, we said, well, we can collect observational data from people that are using CBD from hemp today. That's not a problem. But in order to collect liver information, we do have to take blood. So will you let us take blood? Because usually that is under an IND. It definitely requires an internal review board or known as an IRB through an institution. And they said, yes, we, you don't have to go through the traditional approval process because you're not trying to get a product approved, but you're trying to get us information for the industry. So as far as I know, this is a first of its kind study. And with that, we, we looked at 
normal American humans have about 2.5% of us are walking around with some sort of liver toxicity and we don't know about it. So that being said, to figure out how many folks might have an impact from CBD if they do, we're looking at a baseline of 2.5% and measure the difference. So in doing the math on what is called a power score or a P number, we're looking for a 2% deviation, which takes about 700 people to participate. So what we've done is put together a protocol for 1,000 people to participate. We want them all to be healthy adults, and we'll screen them on the front side. <clears throat> we know some people may have pre-existing liver issues. If they do, we expect it to be 2.5%. So after we screen them, we ask them to keep taking what they're taking for the 30 days and, and tell us every day via our app what they are taking. And at the end of the 30 days, go and give blood at one of the national laboratory chains. And that information will be then sent back to the university and we can pull it all together and then we can see what we see. And so we're not telling people to take a certain dose. We're not telling them not to take a certain dose. We just want to observe what's going on and it's all oral consumption because that's the easiest to measure. If they're also using topicals or creams or bath bombs, we'll ask them to note that as they sign up. So we, we know there's a little bit of deviation, but this gives us a way to go back to FDA and say, hey, you want to know if there's a public health issue, here's what's going on in the public. And we have brands like CB Distillery and Charlotte's Web and, um, and Medterra and Hemp Fusion already signed in, and we're going to going to see if we can limit it to 12 brands. But it would be ultimately great if we can bring 10 in. And so the enrollment period is going on right now, and we would expect to have consumers start participating in or around April, collect data over 60-ish days, and then by this fall, we would expect to be able to have a published study with all the brands participating and get this info to FDA so they can do what they need to do. And so that's really the, uh, the mechanics of the process. And, um, you know, hats off to all the brands that are working with us. This is all funded by the, by industry. Unfortunately, FDA didn't get any funding for this level of research. The farm bill only funded agrarian research for the, for the growth and the harvest of, of hemp. It didn't do anything about human consumption. So there's no federal monies available. And so industry needs to step up to help itself. And um, it's a, you know, it's not a cheap venture and not everybody can afford it. But for those that can, we're really, really thankful that they're, they're stepping forward and, and demonstrating leadership. Well, and you, a valid care and Patrick McCarthy yourself have demonstrated so much leadership because it's you and then those of us industry leaders who know how important this work is that have been really advocating for participation because without that industry participation, it cannot move forward. And again, the FDA is basically demanding and walking the halls of Congress telling the lawmakers, listen, we don't want this forced on us. We really want this safety data. So please don't pass laws that force this on us. We want the human liver toxicity information for ill or good, necessary or unnecessary. That is their stance. It's been made loud and clear. And without your leadership and taking the reins on this, uh, we wouldn't be as far down the road as um, beginning to to work on this on this important study. You've already got the PhDs from the University of Kentucky on this, and all of the infrastructure and ducks in a row now just uh, waiting for some additional companies to participate. Yeah, it's not, it's been it's it's great that way. And what what I. You know, what's hard, I think, for a lot of the brands is many have already gone down an NDI process or they've they've invested in the grass. And to be really loud and clear, (laughs) the FDA is very clear with their communication and people should pay attention to them. But they said grass is not good right now. It's not going to get you there. And they don't really want NDIs right now. They have to decide what pathways before they go for individual product approvals. And so that's the uniqueness of this study. Um, but it's got to be frustrating the number of brands that have spent half a million to a couple million dollars on research that, you know, that research can't be used yet. The good news is if this gets done, there should be the ability for those brands to use that data and or that science that they've already invested in. So I do want to give hope there for folks. Oh, absolutely. And, and of course, particularly the state leader, all of that 
self graph process is important for investors and other than more investors from the, the vitamin, mineral, and supplement space, and certainly pharmaceutical, for them to recognize you because you are moving that process. Of course, it has its benefits, but as we're clear, the FDA is saying animal liver toxicity studies are not meeting the benchmark for us. We want human liver toxicity studies. And, and you know, in terms of the funding, it was in the report language. It wasn't really binding, but of course, the Consolidated Appropriations Act that was signed on the on the 20th of December did provide $2 million for research policy evaluation, market surveillance, issuance of an enforcement discretion policy, and appropriate regulatory activities, I'm quoting, uh, for products under the jurisdiction of the FDA that contain CBD and meet the definition of hemp. Um, but, you know, we're not quite sure what they're doing with that money or, and, or what they're doing with any of those non-binding directives, although there is scuttlebutt that we'll hear something um, within the timeline that that, that non-binding language within the, within the appropriations bill prescribed. Now, let's talk for a minute as we close up here on the CBD Plus Me app. Uh, which is such a fantastic app. And, and for industry who wants to get involved with it, uh, join the HIA or go through the HIA. The Hemp Industries Association is a nonprofit a trade association founded in 1994 that I'm very privileged and honored to lead as president uh, in the current day. We just had our 26th annual conference, and we have a great relationship with Valid Care where uh, our members, HIA members, can get special pricing on their company's branded CBD Plus Me app, and we also get a proceeds, a generous donation of a portion of those proceeds comes back to the Hemp Industries Association. So, if I'm a consumer, Patrick, why is why is the CBD Plus Me app useful to me as a consumer? That's a great question. So. Um, Number one is it gives you visibility into or the opportunity for visibility as to how any hemp derived product is interacting with your personal endocannabinoid system. So you have the opportunity to log in, report why you're using a product. Maybe you just want to report it or you just want to track it and see what happens. Or maybe you have anxiety or maybe you have PTSD, but it then allows you to set a schedule where you report on a regular basis, once a day, once a week, whatever it is, gives you reminders, and then lets you see how you felt before and after because you're reporting that in. And you can report on a number of different products. We have about, um, gosh, I think 700 different um, product lines in there now. And um, if you don't see one that you're taking, you can always add it in. But it also then allows you to do a little research on products where you can go in and under the product area, you can get a full description and see if products are actually certified or not. So we, you're able to filter information so you can see whether a product is hemp authority certified, for example, or if it's organic. Um, and you can understand the difference between a, a, a full spectrum or an isolate. Other than um, the product search functionality, there's actually education, and it's basic education, but it goes a long way on the endocannabinoid system and cannabinoids in general and the difference between CBD and THC, the difference between hemp and marijuana. So it's a really great resource for you to get smart and take care of yourself. Then if you happen to download a version that has been from a sponsored brand like Elixinol or Shaman or other, They'll give you a code where that brand can interact with you more generously in terms of daily. They can push you information, including coupons or promotions or rewards. But most of the time, it's pushing more custom education from that, that customer base or from that, uh, that product company. And what's neat there is if you're interacting with your product company, your data is going back to help them to figure out the science about what products should they be building for people like you. And that's what we love is the CBD, CBD plus me allows consumers to collect to those that care about them ultimately. And then that data can be used to advance product development and or research. So um, sorry for the big long winded there, but that's really the value from a, uh, a consumer's perspective. Yes, getting to know who we are. I mean, I think that we go through life under so much stress and 
many folks are medicating with food, they're medicating with alcohol, they're medicating with prescription drugs, um, and not really paying attention to what the reaction really is or how they're really feeling. And, and so this app allows you, I think, to learn yourself and, and really get to know ourselves better. And I think that that's really the public health revolution that's under taking right now on the planet and, and, a, and a revolution of consciousness where we are learning self-care, we're learning um, to honor our bodies, to honor the planet, and we're re really becoming much more mindful um, in the way that we walk on the earth and the way that we treat ourselves on a minute-to-minute -minute basis. And, uh, and I think that's what some of the great promise of cannabis medicine, also the mycelial kingdom, and the CBD Plus Me app is very helpful in that process. And it's free for consumers to use, which is fantastic and available on the app store. That's CBD plus sign me. Yeah. And best of all, the information that you provide, uh, we key in on an email address as your identifier. So I don't know you by name or otherwise, but the data then can be aggregated and de-identified to use to help better help the community in general. There's also a functionality in there that if, if you like the app, go into the little green cross in the upper right and invite your friends to, to download it as well. And we're ultimately building a, a community of, of cannabinoid altruists to, to figure out what's real here. So um, I, I hope everybody's able to uh, have a little fun with it and, um, and really start tracking the, the impact on this on your health. It's a win, win, win in every direction. Patrick, it's such a pleasure and an honor to work with you, and I mean that in every sense of the word. Thank you for everything that you do to advance this industry, to wrangle the industry, to be a liaison with these important government agencies, and to really just take the lead as you do. Thank you so much for being with us on Hemp Barrens today. Well, thanks for the opportunity, Joy, and, and for all the work you do as well. Have a great day. You too.